from Africa Project Access, MD of Africa Project Access. We are now 18 years old. We assist about 140 companies, mainly based in South Africa, but not all, uh, with early alerts of projects, greenfields, brownfields projects throughout sub-Saharan Africa, outside South Africa, because most of our clients are based here and they're export managers or business development managers, so they don't have responsibility for South Africa. So we'll do Lesotho, Swaziland, Namibia, up to Mauritania, Sudan, the Indian Ocean Islands, and uh, we pro provide the early alert of projects. Uh, we also uh, juxtapose that with, uh, with finance because if you provide an uh, uh, intelligence service on projects, you must um, also include finance because a project without money is a piece of paper. So you have to constantly look at uh, So we are specialists in development finance especially, but we work a lot with financial agencies and other service providers um, in the process. We're a club of Africa players. We meet regularly. Uh, we provide uh, 70 to 90 greenfields, brownfields projects a month. Hi, I'm Duncan Bond from uh, White House and Associates. I'm a partner there. We're a boutique research company. We consult on business opportunities throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, um, do lenders market assessments on new investments, do uh, trade profiles, assist our companies with their um, exports into the rest of the, the continent, finding partners, finding the correct markets for them. Um, so essentially we will take a, a company that is looking to expand into the region and assist them with, with that business development. We work very closely together, um, you know, Paul obviously has, a, has the, a, a great knowledge of the, the projects, the project databases and so on. Um, we do a lot of desk research that Paul sometimes will then take in market and uh, investigate further. Quite often Paul and I will travel together for our sins and, um, and, and investigate markets together for our clients. So we, we, we kind of um, have a, a mutually beneficial relationship in terms of our our skills. We have a situation now where we are basically, and it's not an exaggeration to say that we're having a, a third scramble for Africa at the moment. Um, we have a situation where the world wants our resources, both mining, oil and gas, as well as uh, agricultural commodities. So we are uh, the last frontier in many ways. The, when I say third scramble, in the 1880s when they made all these ridiculous colonial borders in Berlin, um, and never consulted Africa in the process, but of course that was out of the question in those days. And then 1960s with the wave of, uh, of independence uh, against the backdrop of east-west confrontation, that was another scramble. This third one now is based on resources and commodities. So, um, so it's, it's a very global game. For example, in Tet, one of the exponential growth points, which is only an hour and a half's flight away from Johannesburg, the whole world is there. We've even got the Kazakhstanis there. We've got Brazilians. We've got, we've got the Australians. We've got, we've got and a few South Africans. Um, so we, um, it's very global, and uh, it's changing the way of work very much. But I want to just add one thing, just as a sort of sobering factor, is you have a lot of exponential growth points happening now. For example, the northwest province of Zambia, uh, Lake Albert area of Uganda based on resources or for example uh, southern Tanzania, northern Mozambique on the gas, uh, of course Tet with the coal and I can rattle off a whole lot more exponential growth points. Um, on the back of the resources is a, is a trickle down factor whereby um, access roads, hotels, down to uh, building materials, as I often say, you know, sort of half in, in in jest is that you could be selling toothpaste and you'd be selling more toothpaste than, than normal because of the whole knock-on effect of the, of the resources. So this is all very nice and, 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 and wonderful, but we have one major, major problem, um, and it really is a huge problem, is that in Africa, well firstly commodities prices have fallen recently, so it's been, the mining houses and so on, are becoming a bit more conservative than before. Plus there's been some major changes within those companies. Um, but the other thing, basically, we are a continent of stranded resources. We can't move the stuff. So TET is a wonderful example of that, where we've got 20 megatons per annum in the short term, in the short term to move. And the center line, which there was an accident just yesterday on that, so it's now been blocked again, it's unfunctional right now, as we speak, for the next four days it can't be used. Um, it, we can't move it. So what is the good of generating if you can't move? And of course then there's the power situation whereby there's all these power projects but you need uh, transmission lines to move them. So there are, the challenges are enormous and, and, and there is a bit of a slowdown in some of the areas. 
In the oil and gas side, there isn't because uh, gas is very, very um, sought after right now, especially on the East Coast. So f that's why I'm off to Mtwara uh, quite soon for the group of clients to investigate that. I've been to Pemba. Duncan and I went to Pemba not so long ago. So uh, investigating all these exponential growth points. So there's a lot of, when we talk about resources and mining resources, oil and gas and even agricultural commodities, we are talking across a broad range of companies where there are opportunities. There are opportunities and there are projects happening. For example, in Nakala, Duncan and I stood on the site of the new airport in Nakala. That is happening. So the cynics that say, well, you know, there's talk, talk, talk and nothing's happening, that's not true. A, a brief visit to Pemba or, or Tet will show you that there's great expansion. However, however, you've, the, the, this is another point. Uh, there are more and more unsolicited bids as p companies go in in groups. We're hunting in packs. That's what's happening. We're hunting in packs. So as we go in, we're forming consortia and so on. That's why there's never been a stronger need for consulting engineers, contractors, suppliers, and the finance houses, various finance institutions, equity funds through to, to uh, banks, to uh, development finance institutions, who are all part of this game. And we need really to collate and use our instruments like DBSA, ECIC, um, Industrial Development Corporation. We need to use our instruments because that's the way the game is played. It's a very global game right now. There are a couple of things. Obviously the stranded resources can be a, a drag on project development as Paul said, but it also creates opportunities as, as Paul alluded to and I think that's, that's quite important. If you look at, at Sulawesi, northwest province of Zambia, um, the fact that the mining houses are spending 70 million dollars uh, rehabilitating the airport. Um, creates a nice opportunity. The bypass roads around the town of Solwezi, um, obviously the access roads, the, the power transmission lines. So you really are, um, and, and the housing, the, the accommodation, you know, the, some of the mines where you will have a, the, the nearest town only has 2,000 people in it. You've got 15,000 workers and contractors on a site. You're effectively building new towns. From a South African perspective, it's almost a little bit like the old Ellis Rust, what today is Lepalali. Um, in the 70s, the building of Matimba Power Station turned that from a, a, a don't want to say it, an agricultural backwater into a, a growth node, a developing town. And I think that's something that is starting to, to show across the, 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 the continent. What, we, what we're also seeing, I think, is that as you have this level of development, you've, you've got a number of things that are happening in conjunction with the, the, the resource um, play. And that is rapid urbanization across most of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, most cities have been either unplanned or badly planned in the past. Um, and as a result, you, you will find that uh, the, 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 the cities become congested. The main trade routes will, will go straight through a, a city center. Um, that's now starting to turn around where cities are starting and, and governments are saying, look, we, this, this is a long-term development. We need to start planning satellite towns and suburbs properly. Um, and we see that in Lusaka. Um, we see it up in, up in the Copper Belt, where, um, in, in places like Kitwe, mm. where they're looking at building a whole new town across the river from where it is currently. So there's a lot of opportunity with, within that space. Urbanization, development, and that will go from planning a new mining compound through to a new town, through to um, retail, commercial property developments, um, and particularly in areas where you have stranded resources somewhere up like Pemba, um, there, there is very little there already, and you're going to need to expand that over the long term. So we, we, we do see that um, as an opportunity for, for companies, whether you're a consulting engineer or the guy who's supplying the, the aluminium door frames and, and, and windows and so on. And I think that that is, over the next 10 to 15 years, is not going to change. The resource um, prices will probably change and you will have maybe a slowdown if the copper price drops, for instance, or the, the iron ore price. But the longer term prognosis is that the, the urbanization of the continent, um, the growth of agri-industrial opportunities, and we're seeing more of those coming to light, um, we'll see a, a, a longer-term growth prospect. Um, just to underline that, I think one of the, the areas we've done a lot of work in in the last couple of years is in the cement and building material sector. Um, and in the southern African region, at the moment, we're tracking about 45 to 50 
either greenfield or brownfield cement projects. Now, cement is something that underpins development. People aren't building cement plants for, for, for no good reason. Um, and we'll probably see the capacity in the SADC region double in the next five years. In East Africa, you're seeing a very similar um, scenario unfolding. A country like Ethiopia, which for many years was pretty dormant in terms of development, you've now moved from having two or three very old um, state-run cement plants. You've currently got about 16 or 17 at various stages of development, and that might go up to about 20 in the next couple of years from being able to produce a million tons of cement a year to somewhere around 20 million tons. Uh, and that's the kind of growth story that we're seeing unfolding. We should have mentioned earlier on as well, is just statistically the um, growth rates of these countries. While South Africa is registering such a low growth rate, uh, our, border, our neighbours across the border are registering anything from 5 through to 8% growth rate in the case of Angola. It could reach double figures. So, you, we, the, and it's not, and the, the argument that it's often a low base all the time yeah. uh, is getting a thinner and thinner argument because yes. it's, been, it's been at that rate, these rates, even during the dip, we're talking about 4 5% mm -hmm. when, we took the, when the world took a dip. Uh, a few years ago. So um, it's sustained growth. Yeah. So, uh, okay, off a low base. I still have to say low base, but not as low a base as before. And I think that um, that's why when we do our studies together, Duncan and I, to, to an, a, an analyze products and services for a specific company, uh, we have to juxtapose not only HS code analyses to see what the the, 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 the buy of the product is or service is, but also to look at the projects because that could exponentially change things quite dramatically. Um, I do warn, however, we've got to keep balancing this, um, that, for example, in TET, where there's been a slowdown and so on, um, they, we have hyped up the projects to a great degree. You know, Inga has been resuscitated again now. Mm -hmm. We've hyped them up. There will be a, a very cold wind that will blow through the international investment community should we not realize some of these projects, um, because we've hyped them up. Um, Vale, the, the, the rail line going through Malawi to Nakale from Tet will happen. Mm. But uh, I'm pretty sure of that. But there are now another three, four projects also outlined. Will they happen? There are more questions than answers right now. But the transport infrastructure mm. is very important. Now, I just want to change to another thing now. We were talking about commercial property development, which Duncan and I are seeing really a, a bird, uh, growing. Uh, you've got Tartu City, you've got La City in... in in uh, Nairobi, you've got La City de Fleuve in, uh, in Kinshasa. Uh, there's, there's a new one in Accra now in Ghana on the base of it. It's, it's really exciting. But another, uh, everybody knows this, but we should not underplay it, is the ICT telecoms boom. Um, it has been an absolute revolution in this continent. Uh, in East Africa in particular, the Impesa system and so on has, 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 has fast-tracked development. East Africa is looking very interesting from that point of view right now. In fact, Konza City, for example, is a technology city. So the advances in communications with the undersea cables coming through, like Easy and uh, Seacom uh, on the East Coast and also off the West Coast, with wax and so on, there are, uh, we're doing the last mile phenomenon, left, right and centre. We're connecting. The uptake on uh, cell phone uh, usage has, has surprised everybody. Um, and so Africa's getting connected, and, and that's not to be underestimated, because once you start connecting, especially the inland countries, like uh, Rwanda, for example, a small country that's taken a lot of lead in this, uh, to be able to, uh, to connect and act as a hub for the region, very cleverly, I think. Um, the, the, this is this, just the sheer fact of easier communications and data transfer and stuff can have a tremendous effect for our consulting engineering friends, and every, it can be a major impetus. Firstly, uh, I think both of us will have a lot to say about this. <laughs> both of us will have a lot to say about this. Um, because we're constantly trying to, and I've been in this game over 30 years, so, and where I was, felt like a preacher in the wilderness, um, which is not the case now, because now when I talk about Africa, everybody really does listen, uh, whereas they weren't listening six, seven years ago. Um, you know, uh, especially when things, it's always been a f South African phenomenon. When things are good here, nobody wants to export. When it's bad here, everybody wants to export. Right now it's bad here, so they all want to export. So now Duncan and I are smiling for a while. Um, 
So, uh, and, and we have seen benefit from this because most of our clients are based here. Um, but bear in mind that a lot of multinationals use Johannesburg as a platform into Africa, or use Gauteng as a platform into Africa. So it's not just South African companies, but, but you know, they are registered in South Africa, they register South African exporters. But I'd like to say that we have core competencies, like companies, so countries have core competencies. For example, in the agriculture field, we really, really have good, good technologies and so on very good technologies. So we need to unleash those. We're working with the Western Cape now, the number of a, a group there, to try and unleash the Western Cape's a bit of an agricultural hub. So we're trying to unleash that. So uh, there are, I can think of individual companies, like for example, we have an architectural firm, 70% of their portfolio is cross-border. I want, uh, you know, 70% of their portfolio. So um, there are success stories. We have uh, major, in the consulting engineering fraternity, uh, no big secret, we know they're, they're, they're companies like Oricon that are continent-wide, they're busy in Nigeria, not just southern Africa. Um, so, and, and, and Africa's vital, the rest of Africa, shall I say, is vital for, uh, for, the, for the turnover of these companies. So, the, 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 um, the, the great shortcoming is that there is not enough use of the facilities available to us. The Capital Project Feasibility Fund, which I believe now is picking up, I have it in good authority, it's picking up now. People are using it more, but there are various, uh, our export credit agency, ECIC, needs to be used, and the innovative products and assistance we need to use, because that's what our competitors are doing. Sometimes you get the impression that South African companies are, uh, are sort of taking the crumbs that fall off the table. And, uh, and that is why, but it's not true to say we're not there. Like, for example, um, Stefanuti Stocks is very busy in, uh, in Pemba. WBHO is very busy in Tet, just to take two examples. There are plenty more. Um, so we're not that we're not there. And we're also globalizing ourselves a lot. We're talking a lot to, to multinationals and companies from... Uh, so I'm seeing a lot of positive signs. There's far greater collaboration between South African companies than there, what there was before. In the engin consulting engineering fraternity, when you have a major project and you don't have enough CVs to throw at the project, you join hands. Well, you may compete head-on in South Africa, but cross-border, you hold hands. And I, that's a message I often... Uh, bring. But consulting engineers, the top consulting engineering firms in this country, because they do the design work in the earlier phase of the project, they're playing a leading role. They're very important within our client base because they're the ones who can set up the, the situation for our contractors and then later our suppliers to come in. Yeah, I, th I think it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's true. And, but I also think that, you know, as Paul said, it's, it, we've had this ebb and flow of our business community and not just within yeah. the engineering or the consulting fraternity but across the board where you know if it's if it's if it's good here then we we leave the rest of the continent because of the perception of of it being difficult to do business in and, and vice versa when things turn down here but i think we are now starting to see companies taking a longer term perspective okay. um, and wanting to put down a footprint across the continent start gaining traction perhaps in markets that they're not um, haven't been familiar with before. So we're starting to see companies actively approaching us and saying, guys, we need to start moving into a region or a country on a, on, on a much more sustained basis than just the scattergun approach of let's try and find a couple of projects to do. Um, and that, that, I think, is, is the, the way that South Africa has to move. Yeah. Um, in every respect, because because of the globalized nature of um, so much that's happening across the continent, as you said, you know we've got all the BRICS countries involved. Um, the the traditional European powers are, have never left. The United States is obviously engaged on on in, in many sectors in the continent. But what you're also seeing is that the the virtual collapse of activity in Europe is starting to see non-traditional European countries involving themselves. Huh? in Africa. So the Spanish um, getting involved in places like Angola, getting involved in Nigeria, yeah. Kenya, um, places that they wouldn't have before. Um, you're starting to, to see countries from Central and Eastern Europe um, who are taking a far closer look. Ireland, which is starting to expand across the region. Um, and then other non-traditional actors, countries such as Turkey, um, Argentina, Chile, Countries that have, that have taken a look and said, we need to be part of this, this expansion. So it's a very, very global thing these days. Um, South African companies, I think, um, are also not just looking at collaborating with one another, but at a more global level, seeing where they can collaborate with, 
with companies from other, from other parts of the world as well. Some real success stories in, for example, uh, certain uh, leaders, we've, we've, we've been going on the coattails of some of the, the leading South African players. Like for example, um, when MTN years back went into Cameroon and Nigeria, a lot of South African companies went in, suppliers went in on the coattails of that. When Stanbic uh, started its network in Africa, that, that was a great comforter to have a South African bank present. And then there are individual projects, like for example, I was in South Sudan recently, Juba, that what SAB Miller has done there with the brewery there, is, to me, is a model project. Um, and then NAPAC's uh, BevCan operation in Luanda in Angola took a long time. But you can imagine the knowledge that has been accrued from that experience. And um, right now, that's why I'm saying that uh, what we try to do, Duncan and I, to a large extent, is to try and get beyond the level of just information. What we need to do is to know, to supply our clients with what's really going on. Um, and often that can be gleaned from people who've walked the talk. Like, for example, if you speak to NAMPAC, they can tell you what did they experience practically in Angola. Yes, it's important to look at the investment codes and so on. Um, and, you know, things have got much better in Africa. If I think back to the 80s, how difficult travel was and, and so on, it's much easier today. Um, you know, we have a lot of South African companies now present in various places. Um, I've just mentioned SAB Miller and I've been Stan Beck and I'm MTN, but there are many more. Uh, leading lights and uh, so we feel more comfortable it's easier to move around now than before we uh, South African passports you know uh, we, we often don't require visas like just a few days ago Tanzania no visa required anymore for South African passport holders so um, so it's 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 got easier plus um, but at the same time the competition stiff um, so we uh, because of the globalization so we need to know what's really got, so intelligence is more important than information I think it's quite a nuanced thing, you know, you, you, if you travel around the region, you can see a lot of South Africans who um, are quite arrogant about the fact that we're the biggest, the best, almost, you know, people call us the United States of, of Africa. Hmm. That, and, and, but I think that is perhaps something that is slowly working its way out of our system. Um, and that South Africans more and more are realizing that actually they're getting a lot of very good business out of the rest of the, the region. Um, and, that, and, and as a result, there is a bit more respect for the countries that they're operating in. But I think there's another side to it as well. Uh, and that you'll find traditionally in the larger markets outside of South Africa is that there's almost a resentment that a fellow African country is coming in and taking over very comfortable domestic markets that they had. So, for instance, in, in parts of East Africa or parts of West Africa, large regional economies yeah. where they're suddenly saying, you know, oh, the South Africans. And, and so, so it works both ways. I, I do think that South Africans probably need to be a little less boisterous when, uh, when we travel around the continent. But, I, but I, I think that you know, as, as more and more South African companies engage in the rest of Africa and become comfortable engaging in the rest of the continent, that, that we're seeing um, less of the, the, the antagonism or, or even the profile, yeah. simply because there's so many other people out there, the Indians, the Pakistanis, the Chinese. We're now just one of the players on the continent. That being said, I, I just want to say something, is that if you go to Lusaka now, um, it's looking more and more like, I don't want to insult my Zambian friends, but more like, more like Rustenburg, you know, it's, you, 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 can, you, can, you can have, uh, 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 you, can, you can buy a Debonair's pizza, you can eat Nando's, you can stay at the Protea Hotel, you can watch the rugby on DSTV in Potchestrum while you're drinking uh, Castle beer and whatever. So, um, the, 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 the South Africa is a major investor in Africa. Our investment uh, is very, very high profile because it, it, it is very much in the fast foods and, and, and retail chains and so on, you know, ShopRite obviously and all of that. So, um, so that also makes us uh, quite visible and, and, and quite a target for criticism. For example, there's always criticism that we don't buy enough local produce for our retail chains. I think we'll always have that criticism. Um, but there's another thing that worries me quite a lot. Uh, in interacting with the companies, now don't get me wrong, we got, especially in my group, We've got companies that really know Africa well. But the, the knowledge of our continent 
because of the education system, is very limited. I get the most basic questions sometimes put to me. Uh, is Senegal French speaking? You know, um, we really should know that. Um, you know, they are not aware that there's a, a regional grouping for Central Africa called CMAC. People miss that all the time, actually. Even, the, even some of the so-called specialists miss that. So, um, there's, and also the other thing that's not to be uh, negated, as we move in, I've just come back now yesterday from Maputo, Everybody say, I hear people saying, well, you know, Mozambicans these days speak so much English, why do we need to learn Portuguese? They miss the point completely. Uh, when Duncan and I go around Mozambique and I walk in and I, I, I use my bad Portuguese to get through, it really works, it helps. Um, yes, we'll have the meeting maybe in English later on, sometimes not. Um, sometimes it's, you know, I struggle right through the whole meeting. Um, but, um, because I speak good French, but mediocre Portuguese. Um, it, it, uh, it helps a lot. A client of mine, we were in Mantuara recently, and he took the trouble to learn Swahili, and uh, he's taking Swahili classes. You cannot believe how it helped. So, um, uh, the, 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 the gaps in Africa between Francophone, Lusophone, and Anglophone are very real. Very, very real. These are very tight groupings. And you've got to understand the mentality and the different cultures. Uh, culture is a very big issue. Uh, it's a practical business issue. Having local partners is not a nice, you're not, you're not being philanthropic by appointing a local partner. It makes good business sense. Of course, the choice of the partner is critical. You make a bad choice, you can really be in trouble. But, um, but you make a good choice and you will smile. So, it's, you know, should I have, I still hear, should I have a, a local presence? Well, I mean, to me, I just don't even understand why the question is being asked. Because obviously you do. How are you going to understand the mentality in Cameroon? Um, which is not one of the easiest markets. Um, lucrative, but not one of the easiest. So you need to, uh, you need to, so more of our guys that can help themselves in French and Portuguese, who understand the basic geography and history of the countries is very important. Ethiopia, for example, is a very different culture to a lot of other African countries. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a quietly spoken, dignified, a lot of culture. You, you need to approach it. You go in throwing your toys out the cot, you create a bad impression. So we need to, to be very sensitive to this giantism accusation against us, which the Nigerians also suffer from. We um, need to be sensitive to that, but not cower by the same time either. We do have the strongest industrial base in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's a fact. We don't need to apologize for that. But at the same time, we do not know everything by any means, especially on the financial level on development finance. We don't understand a lot of what our fellow African brothers and sisters have been through with structural adjustment programs and things like that. So we need to learn. Yeah, I think, I think there's one, one other thing and that, that, that struck me in the last couple of years is, is we, we also tend to try and impose... Um, models onto other African countries that are not necessarily applicable. And I've had this debate with a lot of my clients here, and they, and they say, oh, you know, we can't understand why we are not getting where we want to be. The Chinese and the Indians are taking our markets. And I say to them, because the Chinese and the Indians understand those markets, the Brazilians as well, the Turks as well, they understand the concept of informal markets, yeah. and that, you know, there isn't a builder's warehouse on every corner um, and that your distribution chains are different. Um, they understand that stick up a factory and the product will get sold. Um, so whilst it, it's, it's obviously good to do your homework and get your feasibility studies done and, and all those good things properly, you've got to understand that you can't impose models onto countries where they're not applicable. And I think that, that um, too many of our companies have tried to do that and when it hasn't worked, they've blamed the market. They haven't blamed the fact that they approached it incorrectly. The, the legal requirements, especially in Angola, where there are lots of things, there's, there's a lot of bureaucracy and you have to... But, but quite frankly, if that's what the law of the country is, you must obey the law. Don't take shortcuts and then blame the country for the fact that you've been taking shortcuts. So, so listen carefully. Get legal help. Um, they, they're companies. We have very good legal companies here. A number of them are my clients, like the Lex Africa Network at Worksman's, for example. Just one example of a very effective network. Get help. Don't try and be smart and, and, and listen to people who have already uh, invested and so on. And, and because there's a lot of assistance that you can get um, uh, before, before going in. Um, one thing that's going to come up, from, uh, it hasn't come up yet, but it's going to come up. Uh, I'm, I'm preempting the question. 
is the whole Chinese thing, um, because I get that every single conference. Um, one of the reasons why the Chinese are so successful is because, and that's the thing I was referring to early on, is they use their instruments very effectively, from the political instruments through to the Sino Show, which is their ECA, China Exim Bank. They use them very effectively. They come in with a holistic solution. And what I'm saying to my clients now, more, and by the way, a more increasing number of my clients are talking to the Chinese. Some even have, uh, have, have operations in China for Africa. Um, for example, in the rail sector is one example. So, um, so, it, so it's happening. But I think what I'm trying to say to clients more and more as you go in, consulting engineers, do some homework first. Don't just go in and say your company is the best thing since sliced bread. What you need to do is you go in and you, pr and you've, what Duncan and I have done for a few clients, for a software company once, where we go in, we sit with the utilities who buy the software and we, 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 we go under the radar and we find out what are their problems. Firstly, who's the right person to speak to? Secondly, what are their problems? So that when you go into the markets, you don't come in, in South African English, you'd say smosing or selling. You come in with a solution providing approach, uh, which applies to product as well as service. So it's very important to, to do your intelligence work first so that you know exactly who to see, because context, this game's all about context. Uh, it's all about context. No context, no business. Um, so therefore, and then by the same token, and patience, of course, but by the same token, you need to uh, know that and then you can go in with a rifled approach and not a shotgun approach. Mm -hmm. um, bureaucracy is still a major issue. You know, you, you'll go into a lot of countries which have come from a, a socialist or Marxist background. They've rewritten the investment codes. Everything looks fantastic on paper, but you're dealing with the same individuals. Um, and yeah. the, the, the mentality hasn't shifted with the, the times in some instances. So that, that can be a problem. Um, and that has a lot of knock-on effects. It's not just about getting your visa on time or things like that. It, it is about delivery of projects. How is that project going to be delivered? Does that government see project delivery as something that it wants to control? Or is it, some, is it open to private um, uh, investment or private interaction. How much control do they want over processes? Um, and particularly with a lot of the infrastructure developments that we see, um, there is still that clinging. Um, we see it in South Africa as well with some of our, our utilities, how they want to control, they still want to keep that. So that is, a, is quite an issue. Um, just in terms of logistics, um, for instance, if you are undertaking projects in, in countries like Angola or the Congo, in many parts of those countries, the Congo is the DR Congo, twice the size of South Africa, um, but in many parts there yeah. is simply no infrastructure to, to undertake a project. And you have to understand that, so that can be a problem. Obviously, corruption um, is an issue. What, what you do start, what we have noticed in the last few years is that um, a lot of countries in Africa are starting to clean up their act. They are becoming a bit more transparent, um, perhaps offer, offer low base in many instances, but that's improving a little bit. Um, so there, there are a lot of issues. It, it revolves around the delivery of projects. It revolves around the infrastructure, the bureaucracy. Um, wish lists, Paul will talk about wish lists versus real projects. I think you want to pick mm -hmm. up on that. Yes, I do. Um, we have to be very careful when we, when we get projects touted to us by the authorities, by the governments. We, they're not always founded on economic good sense. So, um, so, and they often, we've got a lot of highly ambitious projects being touted around at the moment. Some of them will be uh, done uh, in, in an accrued fashion, in phases. Um, but we have to guard very much against wish lists because we can spend a lot of time chasing a project that's never going to see the light of day because it's not well founded economically or financially. So, so, so we need to look at that very carefully and, and you know, do not just rely completely on what's being touted to us as, as a key project because sometimes there are political priorities behind the projects and a project based on political priority and not financial priority, you know where it's going to go. Um, the other thing I want to pick up on is, is very important for our consulting engineering friends, is um, where the tire hits the road, it's at the utility level, not at ministry, ministry level. It's, it's at utility level. In other words, your roads agency, your power agency, your, that is very, very vital. So it presupposes, and this is a big presupposition, it presupposes that these guys are, that these utilities are efficient. 
Now, I have a lot of sympathy for some of the utilities because they're under a lot of pressure. For example, in, in Mozambique, the Rhodes Agency, under a lot of pressure, a lot is happening in Mozambique, and, they, and they, they're not overly paid, these guys. They could get more money in the private sector, and there are some good individuals. I, I want to say that up front. But that being said, if there's inefficiency there, it's going to slow the project. So, um, so and, and that is a big problem because even through your World Bank typical project food chain, your, your project cycle, the, they always talk about the implementing agency because the government of the country is the client and therefore uh, the World Bank lends the money to the country and then the country then assigns uh, and a, usually a utility to implement the project. That means that the, 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 the task manager at the implementing agency has to be um, of a certain efficiency to see the project through. The other thing that drives us mad is uh, the lack of regional collaboration. There's a lot of lip service made, made to it in the African Union and in NEPAD and so on, um, and lots of grandstanding that's going on. But when, once again, the tie hits the road, there's a problem. Like, for example, so many problems about the line going through Malawi to Nakala, uh, especially when the previous government was in power. It's a bit better now. They've kissed and made up to some degree. But, we, but regional collaboration, we're very, very bad at that. And that is why Inga has not moved ahead. The Grand Inga has not moved ahead because it involves so many countries. And that's why the RECs, the, the, the regional economic communities, are so important now. Uh, whether we like them or we don't like them, that's not the issue. They are very, very important. And we have to, um, you know, not throw the baby out of the bathwater. We, we need to, to get the efficiencies up. And then, you see, the, the possibilities of corruption are so high when a signature from, from an official in a utility can mean so much. And he knows that. So, um, and the controls and so on are much better than before. I want to say that having traveled around this continent, lived in it from the early 80s, I have, there's no comparison uh, between yesterday and today. I know we want to talk about the darker side, but it is true that corruption levels have dropped enormously. I'm not saying it doesn't. I mean, Duncan and I worked through, walked through Kasumbaleza, so-called one-stop border post, which is definitely is not. Um, and it took us ages on the Congolese side because there were so many touts and so many people trying to... You know, a cleaning up act is very important. And by the way, on that issue, there's so much corruption in logistics and so on. And logistics is very, very important. Yes. We talk logistics all day long now because it's all about transporting and moving product. Intra-African trade is, 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 is minimal. Uh, it's, only, it's under 10% of, 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 of total trade, and that is a really a damning figure for this continent. And it's because we, we are not doing one-stop border posts like the North-South Corridor aims to do, and they're not happening. Like uh, yesterday in Maputo, or the day before yesterday in Maputo, the main complaint coming from the MCLI, the, the um, Maputo Corridor Logistics Initiative, is um, that this one-stop thing at Rosano Garcia Kamati Put is not happening. Um, and why is it not happening? And we need political will. The Maputo Corridor worked because all three governments were pushing it. Uh, you know, I, I've just come back from, uh, from the Congo again and, and, and the issue of Kassam Balesa came up with most of the, the large formal companies that operate in, in Lubumbashi where, you know, even though they have a one-stop border post, it's the implementation of the, the various bits of legislation and regulation, particularly around taxes, additional taxes, import duties, and so on, that are actually making it very difficult for formal businesses that pay tax to, to operate um, because of the, 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 the flow of, of illegal or informal goods across the borders. Um, and, and this is something that really... Um, I think is, is something that, that really needs to be tackled. If you're going to get intra-regional trade, you have to have all of the governments committed and be working hopefully at the same pace. I think one of the problems with regional projects in general is that different governments work at very different paces. Part of it is, is simply a, a, a question of the, um, the resources they have. One government might be approaching an election, in which case a project gets put on the back burner. It's supposedly part of a regional initiative, but within the country it's a local project. So they might see a roads project as being a local project which is of a lesser priority for that particular government, whereas from a regional perspective it's of a high priority. So it's, it's those kinds of issues, working at different paces. Um, 
that can be a, that can be quite frustrating if you as a, a project manager or a business development manager are looking at a regional initiative okay. you have to break it down into its component just, parts just two, just, just two, two uh, very success good success stories where we're starting to break through is uh, if you look at the Walfus Bay Corridor Group it's actually really got things going and right um, it's to be commended for that and, and the MCLI the Maputo Corridor Initiative um, and it shows that maybe NEPAD, AU, Rex, maybe we need to go one step uh, more immediately down from that ladder and, and, and look at these specially arranged corridor groupings. Yes. Uh, they, they seem to be working far better than anything else uh, right now, where, where, where we're yeah. really seeing regional cooperation. So I think that points something towards the future. In fact, it was discussed yesterday at the NEPAD uh, Africa infrastructure event that I also attended yesterday. Um, it, that came up uh, from a question I asked to the NEPAD and they, they said um, this is where, and, and I agree, I think it makes a lot of sense that at that level it can happen. Uh, firstly, uh, what we're doing as a strategy is to look at the exponent, which is not based on a country. Like for example, uh, Pemba it, with the gas, it's different players, different logistics. It's a whole different world to TET. Um, whole different commodity, different issues uh, altogether. Yes, it's the same country and you, some issues are common, but, um, but we look at it that way. So the low hanging fruit is where you see exponential growth. Uh, for example, in the, in, the, in the new copper belt in Zambia, or even the old copper belt because it's expanding so much. So there's a lot of activity there. So I would encourage clients that depending on the product or the service, uh, but it covers a quite a wide range, I can tell you. I go back to my toothpaste. Um, you know, it would make sense to look at Solwezi. They don't have toothpaste supplies there. So, um, in fact, they've got very, very little that's being supplied from Solwezi. That's just an issue. So, there's opportunities like that. So, I look at it very much like that. But it's true that certain countries have certain difficult regimes. Um, uh, I don't want to down talk any market because, I, because of that danger that I now down talk a market and meanwhile there's a, there's a niche product. Um, but uh, it's not an, always the country's fault. Like I was talking about Angola earlier on, it's true that it's very tough to get a visa for Angola. It's still a major obstacle mm -hmm. and to get flights, but this, that's not uh, entirely Angola's fault. Um, but um, the culture is, is very different, plus being an oil country. In oil, these, these resource-rich countries, there's what they colloquially call the Dutch disease. Up go prices, up goes the competition. Uh, it becomes a much more complicated game, despite the riches that you see all around you. <coughs> so, um, so th those kind of countries are, are, are difficult. Uh, South Africans, and I can't get away from them, I'm a multilingual person, so I'm trying to get people into Francophone Africa, Lucifer Africa, um, but because of the legal system, anyway, South Africans' traditional hunting ground, if I put on a South African in cat and, and act like a giant now, um, which we, we were condemning so much. I nevertheless say um, that the easier touch points for them are in southern and eastern Africa, not only SADC. I always get yeah. irritated by this. What is to say, why should we be constrained by a border made by, by bureaucrats and politicians? We, we, yes, we'll use SADC whenever it suits us, don't get me wrong, for free trade protocols and things like that, which Duncan knows much more about than me. But, um, on the, but what's wrong with Uganda and Kenya? English systems, it's not just the language, it's the legal systems, it's the way of operating, it's the culture. So it makes it easier and that's why, understandably, companies from South Africa tend to look at those countries. That's why our figures with Francophone Africa are so low. Um, because they, they, the perception is that, oh, it's a different system and they also, not just the language, that the, the, the very specifications, electrical specifications will be based on French models in, in many Francophone countries, for example. So. Um, so, you know, th th these, these are very practical considerations. Follow the Rift Valley. Follow the Great Rift. Okay. That, that oil yeah. from South Sudan to Northern Madagascar is all along the Rift. So, and, and, that, and that is, if you look at mm -hmm. development nodes that, that Paul's been talking about, you will see that you have a, an energy node that starts probably in, in South Africa and Botswana with the coal. And that coal seam goes through Zimbabwe into Mozambique. You've then got the oil and gas play from, from Mozambique through Tanzania. You're starting to see um, discoveries of, of, of oil and gas in Kenya. 
possibly in Ethiopia, you've obviously got it in Uganda, you've got the Lake Kivu gas from Rwanda, you've got potential on the Congolese side of the border. So you've got, you've got that nice kind of um, energy-driven um, opportunity on the east coast of, of Africa. It was very interesting when, um, when Tullow Oil first hit oil in Uganda, the, the chairman of Tullow Oil said, you know, 40,000 oil wells have been sunk on the west coast of Africa. Less than 400 had been sunk on the east coast. And he said, this is where a real opportunity is. We're starting to see, obviously, the mining plays again in most of those countries. Most of those jurisdictions which perhaps traditionally didn't have a mining industry, or in the case of Zambia and the Congo, they had a, a mining industry which had been severely dilapidated through lack of investment um, over 20 or 30 years. So we're seeing, I think, those countries, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, Katanga province of the, of the DRC, although it's not without qualifications, um, and then up into somewhere like Ethiopia, which has a, it has a population that is sizable. It has a government that has very, very well-developed plans and has the, has the political will to implement them to take that country out of the, the hopeless continent scenario that, that we saw from 20-odd uh, you know, years ago in, in, um, in, uh, in Ethiopia. I think Angola, obviously, is one that, that we should probably be looking at in, in a bit more detail. Um, the axis, the Kinshasa-Brazzaville axis, is a nice, a nice hub to get, to get involved with. Nigeria, you can't ignore. If you're going to be doing business in sub-Saharan Africa, you can't ignore a country that has one in every five of the inhabitants of sub-Saharan Africa. But, but I, I, we, we can answer this question quite simply by just saying, where are Duncan and I particularly busy right now? Yes. Uh, that, that will give you an acid test of this. <laughs> where are we busy? We are extremely busy in Mozambique. That is a fact. We are extremely busy there. So Mozambique is a huge priority. And, the, and we wouldn't be so busy if we, clients weren't, weren't interested, firstly, and secondly, achieving business. So um, second one, Zambia. Uh, we are extremely... The one to watch for the future, yeah. uh, Zimbabwe. Because Zimbabwe, when it turns, has the infrastructure, has the manpower. It, it's familiar to us. All of us know Zimbabwe, so we, we are going to go in there quite substantially. We already are, but uh, we're going to go in very substantially once the political tide turns. Should it turn, we can't time, no when, but uh, I'm quite optimistic. In fact, I'm preparing a lot on Zimbabwe. Um, and then uh, we're seeing a, a lot of development in Kenya now. Uh, the East African power pool interconnections in that region, very interesting. So. Uh, so, so there are these, uh, apart from the exponential growth points, growth nodes that I was talking about, there, there, there are these, these, these other uh, yeah. perspectives. I think on, on East Africa, you know, we, we tend to be quite cynical in South Africa about regional economic groupings and so on. You know, we, we look and say, oh, well, you know, SADC and it's, what's this? The East African community, which is obviously the traditional three, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, plus Rwanda, Burundi are now part of that, Ethiopia probably will be a, a, a more integrated into that shortly. Um, Kenyan and Tanzanian companies are less cynical about these things and they're actually starting to create a regional hub um, and it's pretty easy to, to move around that region uh, and, and I think if you look at it, Kenyan companies are starting, whether it's retailers or whether it is architectural firms, um, uh, quantity surveyors, all of the, 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 the engineering skills are starting to move cross-border. Uh, and you, you do then have the opportunity to use a regional base, whether it's Dar es Salaam, whether it's Nairobi, to, to create a regional footprint that you, can, that you can use to access quite a lot of East Africa, including into the Eastern DRC um, and South Sudan through you know, somewhere like Kampala. Um, the price of goods in Kampala is determined by what is available in Juba. So you've got a, this, this growing East African regional block, which I think is quite exciting. And I don't think our companies look at it from that perspective enough. They don't look at it from an integrated perspective and say, how can we get um, best bang for our buck in East Africa? And that's something we need to take a lot more cognizance of.
Well, let me put it to you this way. You need bucks, you need uh, Vuma to be able to go into Africa. Okay. You, you, you know, I often get companies saying, uh, we want to go into Africa. And I say, well, have you got a viable um, operation in South Africa? And they say, no, but we want to go into Africa. I say, listen, you've got to establish yourself first. You've got to understand the game. You must be established business. Now, <clears throat> for smaller companies, because it's very politically correct to promote small businesses, but we must be realistic. You need uh, you, it, it, a lot of lead time. When you're preparing a market and you're going to do market uh, prioritization and you're now going to penetrate the market, it is a lot of cost initially. And, and every company must, must understand that. You're going to be, your poor business development manager, export manager, whatever you call him or her, is going to be a cost center for quite a while. Because it takes a while for the orders and the momentum to happen. It could, you could be lucky, it could happen quite quickly, but depending on your product, but don't bank on that. So um, I would say that this is why it's so important that we meet in fora, like I created Africa Project Access, where we can, where the smaller guys can piggyback on the bigger guys. That to me is the most effective. There's nothing wrong with piggybacking. Why reinvent the wheel? You, you, you find synergy, for example, a glass manufacturer can find synergy with an architect with 70% profile uh, you know, in Africa, 70% of its portfolio in Africa, and, and, and say, okay, I'd like to provide the glass for your company. You, you, you're now piggybacking on all that, that architectural firm's contacts is made there without you having to reinvent the wheel. Another thing you can do a lot, and we're fortunate here because Johannesburg, Pretoria, Gauteng is very much a platform into Africa, despite the talk about Nairobi and so on, which are important centres. I'm not saying that. London's also an important centre, so is Paris. But what I'm trying to say is a um, lot of people are here. So you can actually do a lot of business in Africa without even getting on a plane, just by getting to know. We were just discussing before this interview. The, I've just been in Maputo and how many of the mining companies have got major procurement offices here, right here in Joburg. You don't even have to go to, to, to TET. So, um, so, so you can do a lot here and that's very cost effective. So you need to, um, to network yourself in um, and be able to make those correct contacts and piggyback in. And that's what I think smaller companies should do. In the, these, a lot of smaller companies, some consulting engineering firms, say, well, we, you know, these are the big boys like Oricon and so on, they're in there. What are we even bothering for? It depends. Look, have you got sort of, for example, agricultural engineering uh, experience? Because um, that's quite sought after. Now, you know, you could plug in there because agriculture is a big issue. We haven't spoken much about agriculture during this thing, but this interview, but it's very, very important. So, um, so we, we could, you could plug in there. So that it, do not, um, and besides, as you quite rightly say, the, the work is very limited in South Africa now. It's, it's do or die almost now. Yeah, I think so. You know, it, it is that following the paper trail. Um, whether it is the, 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 the huge mining companies in Mozambique, um, some of the mid-tier companies that are floating around. And I think that's really is that there is still, at the moment, this um, ability to generate business out of, out of um, Gauteng. Um, we, we see it still, just having got back from, from the Congo, um, the number of companies up there that have procurement offices down here. And you need to follow that trail and, and try and get in at the ground level. You know, if you're going to try as a small company to go and design Grand Inga, you're probably going to fall apart. But yeah. if you are going in at a, at a much lower level. Um, also, it's one of the things that we've looked at is ancillary infrastructure. Um, you know, if you are a smaller player, but you have the ability to go in and be flexible and operate at, at, a, at a lower cost level, um, things like the mining companies who need a, a, a small 20 kilometer or 50 kilometer stretch of road developed or a mine of mine surface infrastructure that is open you know and that's 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 an area where companies can play if they've got the ability to to um, get into that procurement thing so it's not just about the mega projects and the mega things there's a lot more um, second or third tier development that's happening um, that isn't necessarily tied up in government contracting or donor finance contracting. It's private sector business to business contracting uh, and that is often where uh, a smaller company can play a role. Final thoughts is um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. 
uh, in that there is a lot of opportunity. No, I don't believe that any South African company or multinational sitting only in South Africa can possibly just look this side of the Limpopo. They have to be, it, it's, it's imperative to, to expand. Uh, it, it's, it's just too important and it's just, there's too much momentum. We, we, we have enough momentum now to know that things are going to go ahead. The resources prices dropping and some of the delays we're having are real. And there are people sitting with lots of capital equipment and so on, costing them a lot of money. And uh, there are a lot of complaints going on about the slow movement of things. But the, the, but the momentum is forward. So therefore, um, wisen up very fast. Make those contacts, those key contacts. Listen carefully to people who walk the talk instead of a lot of people who uh, pontificate. Rather, rather talk to people like I do myself. I, I lean off my clients. I, I listen to somebody who's just been, Duncan's just been to the Congo. I'm going to listen to him. He's the king on the Congo now. Um, he knows what's going on there um, because he's just been there. Uh, we used to have that rule at SAFTA. Whoever was last in the, mar in the market is, is the, the expert, no matter whether they're senior, middle ranking or, or, or junior. Um, so, um, you know, and, and network and come out of the closet. Don't, don't become too preoccupied with your product or service that you've got the great, because it's not only price and delivery. You can have the best price in the world, the best delivery, you can have the best quality, but you'll still not do the deal if you don't make those final contacts. I, a lot of companies say, oh, well, you know, we're not going to expand now because we're concentrating on our domestic sales, our domestic market, the South African market. Well, the, the problem for you in, in that respect is there's a lot of companies in the rest of the world that are also looking at this market. It's not an isolated market anymore. We're living in a very, very, the most globalized age yet. Um, and it's becoming easier and easier for companies from anywhere in the world to operate in South Africa or in, in other countries on the continent. And I think if South African companies want to grow and prosper, it has to be because they're taking a, a more a, a broader view of the of the region um, and integrating their growth with growth in the rest of Africa. Um, we see that with a lot of our key Brazilian clients that their next growth focus, organic growth, is in sub-Saharan Africa. They've grown as much as they can in, in Latin America and this is where they want to be now because they see a 10, 15, 20, 40 year business cycle not the next quarterly report or annual report.